Hey friends, Rick from BCW Supplies here in Baltimore, Maryland, in the suburb of Glen Burnie. We're out here at Games and Stuff. Uh, we're gonna go inside, take a look around, and have an opportunity to chat with the owner. Join us for this BCW Spotlight. Hey friends, Rick from BCW Supplies here at Games and Stuff. I am with Paul Alexander Butler, uh, the owner, and he has been gracious enough to join us for a conversation about Games and Stuff on top of the wonderful, fascinating story that is the, not just a store, but your career in the industry. So uh, again, thank you, Paul, for joining us. Um, how have you been? I'm good, I'm good. Just got back from Gen Con. Still, still, still feeling it. Um, but yeah, in a good way, in a good way. Yeah. Gen, Gen Con's an amazing time. I, I saw you briefly there as you were dashing around. Yeah, I tend, to, I tend to f fly past people, sneak in some waves. Yeah. yeah. Hey, how you doing? Yeah. Gotta go. Uh, but so I, I do want to talk to you uh, uh, kind of about the store and about the history of games and stuff because uh, this store has been around for quite some time. But I also want to know, how did you get into gaming? Like, per, on a personal level, I know there's a lot that you do in the gaming industry, but what was Paul's adventure into gaming? So, uh, travel back, if you will, to the late 70s. Um, I played a lot of board games, um, the traditional American board games, um, but also stuff that years later I would discover were Euro games. We just didn't know it at the time, things like Survive, now called Survive Escape from Atlantis, and, and some other stuff. Um, but really, uh, my older brother, um, I have an older brother who's seven years older than me, who played Dungeons and Dragons. And so at the ripe old age of five or six, I was playing first edition AD&D. <clears throat> wow. Yeah, so combine that with, you know, seeing the original Hobbit cartoon um, and my brother's uh, games of Risk and some other Avalon Hill, like old style war games. And it's been around my whole life. Um, and it just I, so I've been role playing since about 1979 as a small kid and never really stopped. And then layer in layer in board games and miniatures games. My first miniatures game was, was Blood Bowl, and then I went bonkers with Games Workshop. <laughs> and then um, you know I played Magic the first year I came out and played Magic competitively for a number of years, not well. Um, but yeah, so it's it's been there since I was a very small guy. That that is absolutely amazing. So it, gaming has been in your life your entire life. Yeah, and, absolutely. And you have made such a name for yourself. I mean, you know, you write, you do stuff with role-playing games, you own a store, you're a key panelist speaker, I believe, or formerly a key panelist speaker, doing a lot of shows, uh, the industry yep. type stuff, um, and a wealth of knowledge. And it seems like it's a lifetime. And, and honestly, I thought I was older than you. Like your <laughs> your skincare regimen must be amazing. Yeah, I'll be I'll be forty eight in a couple weeks. <laughs> yeah. I, okay. So uh, happy early birthday! And I honestly thought you were like I thought I was like the older person sitting at the table. And you're like, yeah, I was playing in like nineteen seventy nine and first edition D and D. And I'm like, wow, I remember second edition, but yeah. uh, not first. So that's I'm amazing. an old man. Don't tell anybody. I didn't. I, well, <laughs> I won't. All right, so now let's let's fast forward a little bit. Like from you know, you play, you you you've touched everything almost in its infancy, like Magic when it first came out, uh, Dungeons and Dragons back in first edition, Blood Bowl into miniature gaming, and we've seen that. I mean, one congratulations on game stuff. Your store is absolutely beautiful. Thanks. I mean, it's well curated. You have a lot of titles from board games, role playing games, and we'll talk more about that in a minute. But you have a wonderful miniature selection, which I'll be perusing when we're done recording this because I'm an I'm an addict. Uh, but you know, and the wonderful play space that you guys really, you, you know what you're doing. This isn't just uh, oh, I like magic and I brought in this other stuff. Like you've touched everything. It seems. Sure. So. How did we get here? Where did games and stuff start? And how did we get to present day? Could you walk us through? Sure, so it's sort of two parallel stories. 
um, because the story of games and stuff uh, at its beginning has nothing to do with me. So I'm not the original owner. Right. Um, so the store was founded in 2000. Um, it was originally called Games and Comics and stuff. It had a, it had a small selection of indie comics as well. Um, I believe the previous owner had bought uh, the remaining elements of a store that had just been a trading card uh, store uh, called The Mint, which later became Games and Comics and stuff. Um, and they had one location, then eventually they moved to a second location. Um, and uh, the old owner used to refer to it as the little shop that Magic built. He was, he was, his real passion was Magic and Dungeons and & Dragons. Uh, and that was the real focus. So around about 2009, I moved back to the area. I'm originally from the Baltimore area, but I'd spent some years outside of Philly. Um, I'd moved back to the area, um, and uh, I was unemployed at the time, having spent the entirety of my adult life running retail stores. So I worked for um, some national and regional chains um, doing retail my whole life, retail management and merchandising and buying and all sorts of other things. So when I came back to the area in 2009, I was, I was freshly divorced. I was trying to figure out what to do with my life. Uh, and I just started helping out at games and stuff because they didn't have a board game nerd on staff. So I started running board game events and I started um, uh, helping with, with buying suggestions for board games because okay. they didn't have somebody who was really on the pulse. So I would, I would help with the board game stock. But having worked my entire life in retail, uh, it wasn't long before I was saying to the owner, I'd say, hey, can I, can I rearrange this display? Can I do this display? So it hadn't been a year with me working very part-time before I had rearranged the entire store <laughs> um, or, or at least re-merchandised the entire store. Right. So come 2010, uh, the, 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 the then manager of the store moved on and the owner uh, called me up and he said, hey, would you be the new manager of the store? And I was, I was waiting tables. Well, I was, I was doing some restaurant management stuff and I was doing all kinds of other things. And I said to him, I said, well, I said, here's the thing. If you want me to run the store, um, I'm not motivated by money, but, but I need to be paid enough so that I can get rid of all these other jobs so that I can really run the store. So we figured something out. So I came on full time. So that was, uh, that was August of 2010. I took over managing it. Okay. And within a few months, I was basically behaving like I owned the place, um, and the old owner liked that. Um, and I started really expanding uh, role-playing from outside of D&D into a bunch of other stuff, since that was a passion of mine. Board games blew up. Um, we, we, so we're about 10 minutes away from where the US headquarters of Games Workshop was for 20 some odd years before they relocated. Right. So, um, and then combine that with, um, it's where Avalon Hill was in the 70s, was in Baltimore, not five minutes from where I live now. So there's this, there's this wargaming sort of, sort of in the bedrock around here. Um, so much so that, that we're, we're doing a lot with miniatures games and then when Games Workshop relocated, we had the opportunity to really, I mean, why would you carry a ton of Games Workshop when the flagship stores down the street? Right. We carried it, but barely. But once they moved, we went crazy with Games Workshop and you know now I have a lot of XGW employees that work here. Um, so we went crazy with miniatures, et cetera, et cetera. Bit by bit, I was adding more. I brought in some books. I brought in more of my own personality into the store. Fast forward a few years, um, 2017, uh, I bought the store outright from the old owner. Um, I had largely been doing most of the operations and buying and things up until that point. So much so that my involvement in the industry, I'd, I'd been a Gamma retail board member for, many, for almost five years. Um, I'd done a lot of other things in the industry, but it got to the point where a lot of industry folks sort of assumed I was the owner anyway, even though I wasn't. <laughs> Guilty. Um, but yeah, yeah, right? <laughs> um, uh, I'm also easy to remember, so everybody's like, oh, that crazy looking lunatic, he was the owner. Anyway, so I bought the place outright in 2000, 2017, so it's, it's been wholly mine since 2017. Um, I don't know, did I touch on everything? Probably. Uh, yeah, I mean, Magic. I mean, ma again, it, the little shop that Magic built. Um, uh, it was, that was always a foundation of, of the store. And this is our third location, having now moved again from where I started. Um, wow. So this store is my design. Okay. Um, so this was an empty shell, and I'm the one who, who you know, I laid out the, the floor. I was very, very adamant that we have a wall dividing the retail space and the, and the game space. Um, I think a lot of, let me reel back a little bit. Before I moved back to Baltimore, I briefly considered opening my own store, uh, my own game store, uh, before I moved back. And in preparation for that, I visited every game store I could within a day's drive. Okay. And so this would have been 2009. 
And what I discovered, unfortunately, was at least back then, was that a lot of the stereotypes were true about what a game store is, which is sort of dark dude holes, right? It's like sort of these dark, <laughs> dark clubhouses for yep. dudes. Um, white dudes, usually. Um, so a big part of what I wanted to do in the design of the store was to make it a more accessible um, uh, environment for everyone. Right. Um, and part of that meant that I wanted a clear division between the game space and the retail space. Because as much as it's easy to focus on the people that are in the game space every week or every day or whatever, a very large portion, if not a majority of my customers that come to the store never set foot back in the game space. Right. So I want to make sure that the retail space is as as a as, as much as a separate welcoming environment as possible without all the noise that sometimes uh, a game space can can do. So can can create. So slapping a big old wall in between the two of them <laughs> was important to me. As strange as it seemed t 10 years ago or 11 years ago, however long it's been. And it's not common in the industry even now. And I, I've seen a couple of stores. I've traveled most of the United States. I've visited a lot of different stores. Uh, and I've got a chance to sit and talk with a lot of different owners. And one of the things that I hear at Gamma, especially when there's a presentation being done, a, a lot of the common questions asked, how much space ded dedicated to retail? How much percentage of the space should be dedicated to organized play type of events? And quite often there are a varying percentage. Uh, and, and I think it changes 60, by 40. it changes by the year too, right? right? Like I mean, the the industry shifts enough that those numbers ten years ago are probably very different from what I, how I would answer now. Right, but 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 it, it, it's it's good questions, but. Again, you go into a lot of stores and you'll find that the organized play is either off to one side or, or takes up the majority of the store, and the retail is the outer wall. Like, you've got to walk around yeah, yeah. the organized play. And that can be very off-putting to somebody coming in looking for a game for family night. Sure. Or, or somebody who's new into something and you come in and you're immediately overwhelmed by people that have spent years in it. It can be overwhelming. And your space really allows the shopper, the retail customer, to have a retail experience, yep. and the game store player or or regular to have the regular experience. And nobody feels isolated or shut off because both spaces both spaces are adequately large. Both spaces are well lit, well designed, nice layouts, comfortable chairs and tables. I mean, you, you put a lot of thought and work into it, and it shows. It really well, thanks. does. Thanks. Yeah, I mean, I, I think it's real easy for um, uh, for us to all become the, the Simpsons comic book guy, right? Like, it's, you know, to say nothing of looking down our nose because a, a person's buying something that we don't necessarily care for. I mean, that's a whole other conversation. But but I think it's, it's I, th I think it's a mistake to emphasize uh, events, event space, organized play space over the retail space. Uh, they, they need to kind of exist in in in, in cohabitation, right? Um, because the fact of the matter is, if you've got three or four tables of gamers that are having a great time and being rowdy and not in a bad way, but just being excited, that's not always the environment that people want to shop. You know, I mean, on any given day, I could have somebody walk in that just wants to be left alone and kind of quietly look around, um, and you know, sometimes those game spaces right there in retail is creating a very different environment. Um, right. So having having two two environments is is always been my key. So, or it's always been a, a, a key part of my sort of retail plan, at least since moving into this location. And, and I think I think it's a great one. And I understand sometimes you're limited by space. You're limited. Not every store can have sure. a wall and doors and dedicated space. And that's just part of the pains of growing. Right. But I, I honestly, I, again, I love the way the store is laid out. I, I I've seen a trend more recently where. Some of it is as stores expand, then they get a unit that was right next to them. They, right. they they just put doorways in and leave that center wall. And one side is the organized play, and one side is the is the retail space. And, and it's becoming a little bit more common. But you're right. Ten years ago, that wasn't a common right. occurrence at mm -hmm. all. Like you didn't see that. Uh, I don't think in most places. So I really like that innovation. And I, I do want to talk, you know, we're kind of caught up on the history. Thank you sure. for the tour and, and, and how things came to be. But It's complicated. <laughs> it, there's a map in the description that I forgot to include. But there, there is, uh, you know, like we're, we're now present day. We've gone through, you know, a, a rough transition um, that I don't really like to, to harp on. But, you know, we educated consumers. Uh, and to interact with people online 
and that was out of safety and necessity, which I, I am okay with. But now part of this series is trying to get people to come back into the store. Sure. So uh, walk us through, like, if you would, what are ways people can connect with games and stuff? What are ways that uh, things that happen in the store on a regular basis that you would like to plug? Like this is the shout out time. So, so how can people interact with the store and be involved or, or things they can connect with. Sure, so um, so we're all over social media. We're, we're Games and Stuff on Facebook, uh, all spelled out. And then on you can find us on uh, Twitter and Instagram, uh, Games and Stuff MD, um, and uh, TikTok too for that matter. Um, uh, we also have an online store, so that was not something that was a priority of mine prior to COVID, and now it's um, a very important part of what we do. Um, and it's just gamesandstuffonline.com right now. You can find uh, almost our entire inventory online. Oh, wow. Um, not, not quite everything, but we're getting there. It's almost everything. Um, so that's uh, that's that's a, a big part of, of how a lot of customers all over the country can interact with us, whether they've been to the store or not, or whether they used to be here and they moved away. Um, but we're starting to get a real customer base that's not, not necessarily uh, local. Uh, locally, I mean, we have really ramped up our event schedule again. We've got stuff going on all the time. I mean, there's, there's at least some sort of open play event uh, every day of the week, um, and we're you know we're regularly firing magic events and miniatures events are big for us. Um, D and D Adventures League type stuff. Um, it's a pretty robust event calendar. Um, we're actually in the process of we sort of have Frankenstein's monster of websites right now because we have the old website that has event stuff, and then we have the new web store. Uh, so smashing those together is a current plan of mine that's been taking up a lot of my time, but that'll hopefully be done uh, sooner rather than later. Okay. Um, yeah. So there's a gamesandstuff.com and a gamesandstuffonline.com. Uh, and they talk to one another, but they're two separate okay. Frankenstein beasts. But they will soon be smashed <laughs> together gloriously. Um, <laughs> little electric bolts. Yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> little bolts. I mean, whatever. Um, but yeah, I mean, in store, uh, uh, I think I think you know we've got a pretty big staff, and we have a lot of specialists on staff that that you know we carry a lot of stuff. You right. know, um, you know, it's it's easy to say, oh, we specialize in this and that or the other thing. But I mean, we've got a lot of stuff. I mean, we have. I'll put my my role playing category against. Up, up against almost anybody's. Um, uh, our miniatures category is very robust. We carry a lot of little uh, sort of small skirmish games. A lot, of, not a lot of folks carry. We carry a lot of imported third-party uh, miniatures and hobby accessories. Um, we do used board games, used role-playing games, um, Magic singles, of course. Uh, um, we've got a paint station. Um, I mean, in store, there's a lot going on, uh, and there's a specialist or three on staff to talk to you about any one of those things. Now that's amazing that, I mean, just, just looking at all of these different things that you have. Now I do have a question about the used board game section. Sure. So are you, are these demo copies that are now for sale or are, are people trading in or are you these buying? Are, yeah, these are, these are games that we, that we, that we buy from customers. Um, okay. uh, typically, uh, we don't, we don't, we're not going to sell demo copies unless it's something that I've opened. Cause I mean, you know, you, you get demo copies free from a, from a publisher. Right. I think that's bad form to then turn around and sell it, right? So, yeah, um, I mean, that's there for a reason, right? Right. Uh, but the, the ones we sell, we typically buy from customers. Um, sometimes I buy large collections or even estate sales. Um, during 2020, I, 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 bought a, I bought a collection that, that numbered 3,500 units. It was a guy that used to run a, used to run a game club um, in the 70s and 80s, and it was 3,500 pieces. Um, and it was 2020, we were shut down. Uh, and you know, I, I was lucky enough to get some payroll protection money from the government. So guess what I had people doing for weeks on end was counting counting pieces of 3,500 board games. That it's all gone. We sold it all. That's amazing. Yeah, yeah. It's, I mean, it's pretty rad. I mean, anytime you buy a collection and there's you know seven complete copies of Hero Quest in it, it's a good day. Yeah, and I, and, and I saw that that's getting a, a relaunch. Oh, it's out. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. yeah. I, I was yeah. like, Man, that's. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Awesome. but um, uh, uh, but yeah. So we do buy them. Um, we're 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 on a pause for buying right now, only because we're pressed for space, um, and that happens occasionally. Uh, but we'll be picking them. We'll be picking up used stuff again soon. Um, and same thing with role playing games. Although we're, we are actively buying role playing games at the moment. But yeah, so we're happy to take stuff off people's hands. I mean, board games are such a thing that, you know, you get to a certain point of your collection and it's taking up your life because board games are not small items, and sometimes you just need to do a call. I will happily take them off your hands, turn them into new games. And, and see that—that's an awesome feature. I've never heard another store do. I'm not gonna. I'm, there's there's I, a few I, out there. Um, a lot of people do it slightly differently than I do. In fact, I—I I, you know you talked about me doing seminars at, at trade shows. I, I did one recently, um, just about used games and the way that I do it and the way that it differs from the way a lot of other stores do it. Um, everybody's got their their 
their own procedures for doing it, and the way we do it works for us. Yeah, and and that, but that's what I'm saying is, is like I've I've seen some stores do like community auctions where they they allow people to bring stuff in, set it up, and, and the store gets a small percent. But I I have a board game collection at home because I I get sure I, I do get to travel around, I get to play different games, um, and there are some that I played once or twice but nobody really vibed with, nobody liked, and it's just a shelf space, and it's normally the lower shelves of my, my, my Ikea. Well, I mean, board games, too. Uh, it's like somebody, yeah, it's a, <laughs> board games, uh, it's such a cult of the new, right? Like, everybody wants to play the new thing, and there's nothing wrong with that, but at some point, like, you find certain games have replaced other games in your collection or whatever, and I, right. you know, I'll often come to the, you know, with my personal stuff, I, I'll often come to the conclusion that, oh, every time somebody suggests we play game B, we realize, oh, well, let's just play game A instead. That covers a lot of the same ground, and then B never gets played, so I should probably just get rid of B. Yeah, I know, just, so. but, but see, coming from a competitive magic and card game background that I do, trading in cards for new cards is very common. Yep. I mean, that is, that, that is how you grow your collection into, I never looked at it like, oh, board games could do the same thing, or not, not that you're gonna get the same value. Well, what's interesting, for, for good or for ill, you know, people now talk about their board game collection, or the, you know, they they're they're collectors. They they want. I, I think the collecting is as much a part of the hobby as the playing, almost at this point, for many people. For sure. Yeah. I mean, I I, I may or may not be a huge fan of uh, Red Rising uh, series, book series. Sure. I, I love that series. It's well written. But I may or may not have backed the Kickstarter for the collector's edition of a game that. It, I, I had never, I knew nothing about. Sure. Just because it was FOMO's a thing, right? It, like, I, yeah, I, yeah. I wanted the collector's edition of it, and it's like, yep. yeah, I have that. So, I, I, I mean, we and we carry, we do a lot of Kickstarter backing as a store. Like, we carry right. a lot of Kickstarter stuff. I mean, I got four pallets of the most recent Marvel United stuff because people want that wow. stuff, right? And I, yeah. you know, and as as buying patterns change, like, you know, you know, a lot of our success has to do with we've got the thing that people want that other people don't have. You know, and thankfully we're big enough that I've got the cash flow to be able to say, yes, please, I would like four pallets of Marvel United X-Men. Um, and now most of it's gone. That's so, so amazing. Yeah. Like, I'm happy for your success. I'm really happy to see such a diversity and specialization. Like you talked about, you have a bunch of experts on staff. At any given time, if you have a question about anything, you can come in, you can get an education and not in that comic book Simpsons condescending kind yeah, of Yeah, we're just way. here to help people right. find their brand of fun and, and show them more so, fun that they like, right? Like, right, and that's amazing. And I appreciate that attention to detail, that curating of not only the collections, the staff, the knowledge, your time in the industry, the stuff that you've done outside of this in writing. But my, I, I do want to ask what's next? Like, you have everything right now. So do you have anything coming up that you want to talk about or so, allude to? So, I mean, there's always something, right? <laughs> so um, uh, what I don't have right now is more space. Uh, we, are, we are successful to the point where uh, we're kind of bursting at the seams. I have multiple offsite storage units. Um, a lot of our success in the last couple of years has been, you know, you know, to, to speak to the used stuff, right? Like, what sets us apart is we've got used, used games that people can buy, and which means I've got out of print things, right? That you normally would have to track down on eBay or whatever, right? And we do have an eBay store too uh, to help to help move through some of that stuff. So I've got the used stuff in in board games and role playing games. We buy heavily on a lot of Kickstarter things. Um, and then I'm pretty good at sniffing hits. So I mean, I mean, we went sort of viral a couple times for with a photo of my stock of Ark Nova when Ark Nova hit because I had literal piles of it when nobody else did. So being able to identify those trends and, and buy into them, um, you know, means I've got the stock to last through the through the the famine before the next print run hits, right? Right. Um, but what that does mean is if I'm going to buy stuff by the pallet load, it's got to go somewhere. So what's next is really trying to figure out a solution for my space issue. So whether that means looking at expanding or a new location or a different kind of offsite storage solution, um, that's that's a that's a big part of it occupies a lot of my time right now. Um, uh, we're imagine. also we're also working with some some big name marketing companies to kind of help you know kind of give our give our our brand a refresh. Um, we're just we're we're kind of ready to move to the next level, and and, and I'm going to be intentionally vague because the the ways in which that will uh, 
be perceived by the consumer, I think, um, might not be immediately obvious for a while, right? Like, well, and, and that's the thing is, is with any expansion or any any future goals, you have a plan of what it wants, what what it looks sure, like. Sure, sure. And you want the customer to see that finished product. They don't need to see behind yeah, the a, behind the drop cloth that's yeah, covering yeah. the the dust yeah. and debris while you're yeah. paying no attention to the man behind the curtain. Right, 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 yeah, right. Yeah, yeah, fair yeah, fair enough. Yeah. So there, are, there <laughs> we've got we've got some some. I've been spending a lot of time and energy on some big picture stuff um, uh, that is still some time off. Well, I can't wait to see what it is because yeah. everything that you have touched, you've put your heart into, you've put your experience into, and you've really curated for the end consumer, for that retail experience, for that play experience, your selection. You can walk in and find something that you want. And I mean, it's not just you know, oh, I, I need this pot of paint. I could come in and have a conversation about paint, which paints better, I'm sure. sure. And, and, and I could end up spending lots of money, not uh, trying to say that that's, you're forcing me to, but just out of the sheer, I learned so much that now I need this because I can do well, all this other and, stuff, and, which is amazing for me. Well, like, the, way that I, the way that I talk to my, my, my staff about how to connect with customers, I never want them to feel like they're salespeople because right. I never want a customer to feel like they're being sold to, right? But, but I want them to feel like tour guides, you know, or, or vectors for passion and excitement, right? So if you come in asking about paint, if I've got somebody, you know, who can talk to you, about some real minutiae about paint techniques or this or that or whatever. All I'm doing is showing you more cool stuff. Right. Right. So, and odds are you're probably gonna buy some, right? Yes. Um, but I, I, I never want people to feel like they're trying to upsell you on this other thing, right? Um, you know, I, I'd much rather, you know, especially for new customers to feel like, you know, that scene in Willy Wonka, you know, where it's like, oh, there's a chocolate river. You know, it's just like, <laughs> you got everything. Me and you'll be. <laughs> In the world. Anyway, yeah. Um, but yeah, I just I just want people to see sort of the the breadth and scope of of all the cool stuff that's out there. I got I got a timeout real quick. Gene Wilder or Johnny Depp? Oh, Wilder. Thank you. All right. <laughs> Thank you. That's the only acceptable I mean, answer. I mean, sorry. Like yeah. <laughs> in my in my opinion, sorry if I just offended your favorite Wonka. But yeah, no. Uh, anyway, what I was getting at though is, is that you you personally curated and helped curate by surrounding your staff and yourself with people that are extremely knowledgeable. It's not just a job. It's like you said, connecting people with their passion and helping people explore new passions and, and finding different things. So I can't wait to see what the finished product is. I sure. can't wait to see, you know, I, obviously, you know, the online stuff, the used stuff, uh, bringing the two websites together. Uh, I, I'm excited for it and I really can't wait to see the finished product because I'm in love with the current product. I, I, well, thanks. I mean, you are a two hour flight away from me. Um, but I love coming out here. I think every time I've come to the Baltimore area, I have found an excuse to come out to the store. And uh, you know, well, I mean, we're so different. I mean, we're, we're <laughs> ten minutes away from BWI Airport, so yeah. I have I have regular customers who live in Texas, who pass through for work or whatever, and they will make a point to stop here. And they're you know, they might be in two or three times a year, but I they're regular customers, just not that regular <laughs> but but I, yeah yeah it, it's amazing and and now knowing that online options are available uh, or or they are available currently but it's a little frankenstein and it's going to get smoother 95 percent of my stock is on our web store right yeah like the the you stuff isn't on there uh, like again we transfer some we we, we transition some of that to, to ebay mm -hmm. um and i just you know I, I want that i want that old school record store experience for people looking for the used stuff right like i, I like I'd, I'd rather not all that that used and collectible stuff go to the. I want to. I want to. I want that to really focus on my my in person customers. Right. But if stuff lingers a little long or whatever, or if it's, you know, if it's a five hundred dollar used board game after it gets a shot on the sales floor for a little while, it will make the transition to eBay or what have you. Um, but yeah, I mean, there's there's a, only a tiny fraction of my regular like new stock that's not on the web store, and that's only a matter of time. And, and that's that's absolutely amazing. So I, Paul, thank you so much for you know walking us through the history. Sure. Thank you for the insight into the industry. And thank you for just having a wonderful conversation with me. I, I greatly appreciate it. Sure, man. So yeah, thanks, thanks, for, thanks for hanging out. No, this is awesome. I can't wait to go shop. All right, cool. <laughs> All right. All right, friends. I do want to thank you for watching this video. Again, I'm Rick. This is Paul. And this is Games and Stuff in Glen Burnie. And, uh, you know, when it comes to protecting, storing, or displaying your hobbies or collectibles, BCW has you covered.